Hi, listeners. This is from Ideology to Unity. At least I'm from Ideology to Unity. If you're listening on Gary Hartley's podcast, it it's not that. It's the uh, well by the chalkboard. By the, by the chalkboard, yes. Yeah. So this episode is different because we're both recording, both our ends, and we're having a conversation instead of one person interviewing the other. So I'll give my introduction. He can give his. It's a bit different from normal, but hopefully you enjoy it. So, hi listener, this is from Ideology to Unity, a spiritual journey where we let go of ideological doctrine and ego in favor of meaning, purpose, and unity as a whole. Yeah, so here we are. Thanks, Nick. This is Gary Hartley. My podcast is By the Chalkboard, exploring a greater awareness of life in all different aspects, spirituality, looking at uh, world events, but really focused on, on uh, improving, uh, improving our own lives where we have a greater uh, purpose and understand that and can uh, operate in a way from our heart and not just from uh, our thoughts and our mind. Why is that important to you? Well, this comes from my experience because realizing uh, a lot of my life, what I was doing was just coming from just my mind, just the intellect, which is very limited in ways. And when I begin to understand that, uh, and I've got, uh, uh, there, there's a deeper voice. The only way I can describe it is a voice. There's a voice that comes from my heart. It comes from this great expanse, it's, it's not limited, there's no boundaries there. And when I begin to understand that voice and listen to it here and have experiences with different things, with dreams and, and studying all sorts of things from all around the world, it just, it opened up my life in a brand new way. Yeah, well, I've, been, I've had a similar experience. So would you say that when you've got a closed heart that you're operating more on a level of fear and maybe other emotions that stem from fear, like anger or maybe even pride or hatred. Yeah. And I think from, again, from my experience, I, I let, I let those things, I let those fears, um, I guess, control me in a way, you know, I would let them, uh, I would, how would I describe it? As if those things are happening to me. Oh, this fear is happening to me. Yeah. Instead of being able to uh, do what I do now is fear still comes, but I step, I can step back from it and look at it without judgment going, okay, I, I see this fear within me. I see it. It's there. I accept that it's there, but I can do with it what I want to. I can still operate the way I want to, whether those fears, feelings and thoughts of fear are there or not all right so suppose you wake up in the night and sudden you feel anxious maybe it's about something irrational like there's a ghost in the room or something else you know something like that how do you what do you do with that fear to how do you deal with having it in a healthy way yeah that's a good example because that's happened to me and I'm sure it's happened to other people wake up in the middle of the night suddenly with fear. It's not, it's not always a rational thing. It's just something that's, that's there. It's present. Um, the way I do it is, is I, I stay within myself. I stay still and I just, and I guess in a sense, observe it. I'm just looking at it and okay. I see this fear. I recognize the feelings in, in my body that are coming from uh, experiencing that fear. You know, the, if there's anxiety, okay, I, I feel this anxiety. I feel my heart racing or, you know, elevated perhaps. And I always go back to the foundations of things that I've learned in my life. You know, uh, I was born and raised in a Christian environment, and I'm very thankful for that foundation. And there's a lot of just beautiful things in the Bible. And I'll, I'll often go back to those things of the comfort and the peace of God. And uh, 
recognizing that fear doesn't control me, whatever this feeling is, or whatever memory is coming up in my mind, those things are not something that can control me. I can uh, become aware of it, stay in aware of it. And I don't know, it's a way of like bringing it into the light is one way to describe it. Right. So how long does it take for it to either leave you or be transmuted into something else? I don't know if there's a time frame. It the the greater my awareness has grown, the the shorter that time frame becomes. Right. The reason why I ask that is because my issue is that I've become better at dealing with anger. I can actually let go of it quite quickly now. But the thing is, I feel like nature, if I it's nature, anger is more at least for me, it it comes in up bubbles up quicker from within. And then it sort of well, that's just me, but then then I can, but when you actually accept it, it goes away fairly quickly. Whereas I found with fear, when I'm afraid, I was like, okay, I'll accept that I'm afraid. And I just, I'll let it go naturally rather than trying to repress it or make it go away. And then it's still there. I'm like, okay, if it was anger, it would have gone by now, but I'm still afraid. And I'm still thinking that like, oh yeah, I'm definitely feeling this definitely still feeling this and there's this part of you just also just be like just just go just stop go now that's the worst thing to do because that itself would repress it right but i just feel myself like i'm sure a lot of you if you're listening i'm sure you've experienced something similar at some point like fear is still like a really fundamental emotion if you haven't got past it like it's easy there's some things that this is my experience anyway there's some things it's easy to get past but fear is like more fundamental because it's a really survival based thing well i mean I suppose anger is too but what do you have to say about that you know one of the things that helped me uh it was what i don't know a few years ago i I was just browsing on YouTube and I saw a video with Eckhart Tolle and I watched it because of the title. The title had something to do with somebody asking about being free of fear. And I thought, oh, I want to be free of fear. I wonder what Eckhart Tolle has to say about that. And so in this video, I think it was a woman asking him about how to be free from fear. And I was anticipating his response. What is this? This man who's mastered this inner life, what's he going to say? And his answer completely surprised me. He said, I am aware of fear within me all the time. And I thought, what? <laughs> this is like I'll talk, right? How? <laughs> Wait a minute. That, the question was to be free of fear. And he went on to describe, it's not about being free of fear. It's about recognizing when it arises and stepping back and looking at it going, okay, it's here, accepting that it's there, not fighting it, because I had fought it my whole life. And fighting it, when you fight that fear, it's not going to, you're, it's not going to produce a good outcome, because it's like, it's like having your right hand fight your left hand. Okay, try that sometime and see who wins. You know, you, there's no winner in that. This fear is coming from within you. And if you're fighting it, you end up fighting yourself and you can't fight yourself and win. And it's not a fight. Um, going back to my Christian background, there's a verse in the Bible that talks about uh, taking your thoughts captive. Taking thoughts captive is a different, completely different thing than fighting your thoughts, fighting these thoughts of fear. And when you take them captive, it's a way of saying, okay, I'm stepping back and looking at them and I'm going to do with them what I want. I tell people I can control my hand. I can do anything I want with my hand. I can keep it still if I want. I can move it over here. I can pick something up. I can use my hand for something good. I could use it for something evil, but I can do with my hand exactly as I want to. You can do the same thing with your thoughts. It's like a limb. It's like what? It's like a limb. Yes. It's how do you control it then? You just to make you just decide to. I wouldn't even use the word control. It's more yeah. of I can do with it as I want. 
I see this fear. I, here's a good way to describe it. And I learned this from, from Sad Guru, a guru in India. Uh, he was talking once about responsibility. And I used to hate that word. I hated the word responsibility until he described it. He said, responsibility is simply your ability to respond. You have an amazing ability to respond. In fact, you can, your ability to respond is limitless. Your ability to control things outside of you is very limited in a lot of ways, but your ability to respond is always there. And so I always go back to that when I have these feelings of fear or anger or emotions arise, I'll step back and go, I have a limitless ability to respond. I can respond to this. I can respond to this in a good way. It's simply a response. Sometimes responding means being still. You don't have to be active in physically doing something to respond. It can be a stillness. And I think when those emotions arise, for me, that response of being still has been very helpful to sit back and just look at it, watch the emotions, watch the feelings in my body, look at my thoughts that are arising. Because a lot of times those fears are based upon memory, this memory of something in the past that's coming up, that's triggering something, some, you know, some emotion. If I step back and just look at it somehow, and I can't describe it really in words, somehow it, it just helps dispel it. It's like, it's like the fear is a shadow and looking at it is the sunlight and the sun dispels all shadows. I suppose so, but it depends on the angle, right? Because sometimes it intensifies the shadow. Uh, I'm thinking I'm being pedantic. Yeah, I mean, one thing I did do is when I accepted, I found this situation where I felt fear, I accepted it, it stayed there. In fact, but the thing is, like five or 10 minutes later, it was gone. It took longer than anger, but it goes. So I guess that's one way to respond to it. Yeah. So we're not enslaved to our fear, but we are if we don't realize that we're not. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe it's a, it's a, for me, it's, a, it's, it's an awareness of it. Being able, it's so freeing just to be able to calmly look at these things. Sometimes if I have those emotions and they're intense and arise, I'll just lay down in the floor and close my eyes and just lay there and watch them and look at these things. Go, okay, I see this. This anger is there. This frustration is there. These thoughts are there. And I'll just look at them and, and sometimes kind of analyze them in a way and go, okay, this thought that I'm not worthy is there, but that's not true. And I know that's not true. Okay. So what is true about me is that I'm a valuable creation. There's something important about me being here. I, I don't have to entertain that thought anymore. I do that with fear, do that with anxiety. I used to be a very anxious and a full of anxiety person. I've had social anxiety for most of my life and I didn't even know what it was. It would make me physically sick to be in social environments sometimes. Yeah, I had that. It took a long time to improve. Like you wouldn't, I don't come off like someone who, who's had social anxiety or someone who, I don't know if I was an introvert, but I certainly identified as an introvert for a long time. I identified as shy. I couldn't think of things to say with people. Like I, maybe with adults. With adults, I was able to talk easier than with people my own age but i just often just didn't know what to say and i just yeah and there was that anxiety as well right and i just i found you know you put yourself in social situations and it can, you gradually get used to it but was it different for you but it was a more spiritual awakening that changed it for you yeah definitely um It was the spiritual awakening, but it was also, again, going back to responsibility, being able to respond and doing something with it instead of sitting with it. Because a lot of times when I was socially anxious in an, in an environment, I would be closed in 
and not moving or, you know, in, in that uh, gathering or wherever I was. And one of the things I've learned is if I will take action and go do something, like start talking to someone, especially noticing people who are on the fringes of a social gathering on the outside, maybe standing by themselves, I would make an intent to go over to someone and just introduce myself and talk to them. And it would, it would just dispel that anxiety with me and often with somebody else. Yeah. You know, because who, if they're at the fringes of it, they might be going through something similar. Yeah. And I begin to notice that I begin to notice those people. I'm like, Hmm, maybe more people experience this. <laughs> I'm not the only one in the room. Yeah, it's so easy to think that it's only you and everyone else. A lot of people put on a front. So you think that everything's going smoothly with them and you're like, Oh, you're the other one out. Right. It's so easy to think that. Yeah. And all that's Mental just, illness, yeah. And all that's, that's just made up in your mind. Your mind makes this stuff up. It makes then, so much stuff up. <laughs> yeah. And the way I describe it is, you know, it your, your mind will make up this little story that I'm alone in this room full of people. And then that little story becomes a whole novel. And then that novel becomes an epic movie. And then that epic movie becomes a trilogy of movies, you know, and it just keeps growing and growing and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And if you stop it at the beginning, when you first experience that and go, oh, okay, I'm experiencing this anxiety here in this social environment, do something about it. I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to take action. I'm going to realize that I have this limitless ability to respond. I'm going to respond to this in a positive way. How am I going to respond to this? If I'll sit and just listen, something will arise within me naturally. Like I'll see somebody and go, I'm just going to go introduce myself to that person and start talking to them. And I'm telling you, in my experience, doing that is just, it's been an absolutely amazing thing. And it's created more boldness in me. You start having wonderful conversations with people. They start opening up. You start opening up. You learn how to ask good questions. They ask you good questions. You make friends. Did you force yourself to do it? Or did yeah. you just allow yourself to? Yeah, I used I had an issue with approaching women in nightclubs. Now, I've, I've moved on from that whole interest, you know, in the, you know, the, the casual sex chase or whatever, you know. I'm sure every guy, a lot of guys have gone through that at one stage, right? <laughs> like, but at least when it came to approach, approaching women anyway, it just, just it made myself do it. And even if I completely flopped at least i did it and i feel like i grew from that even if there was a definite shallowness to the whole to the whole thing yeah yeah it, it always becomes a, a a better experience if you reach out and do something with it you know it's better to try and uh learn from that than to not try at all to just realize okay i'm just going to set myself out here because if you don't do it you're going to kick yourself and beat yourself up about it but at least if you do it and you don't get the response that you're looking for there's still something within you that says okay i did it i still stepped out often the fear is worse than what could happen not always but often so yeah yeah, because yeah. you make you make up expectations, right? You you see something you think you want to do, whether it's approaching a girl or, you know, in business or just in life in general, in different ways, and then you start your mind starts making up all these scenarios, right, of what could happen and might happen, and what could possibly reflect back on you. But all those things are just made up in your mind. You have no idea what's about to happen. So for you, was it more for you? Was it more fear than anything else? Was there any anger? Were you angry? A lot. Um, I've never been. I don't think a real angry person. Maybe frustrated. Um, in a few areas of my life, it, it was just, for me. It was more fear than anger. Right. Um, I. I feel like it 
anger develops from fear. So I've got this, I won't even call it a theory, but this idea I came up with recently that it's like a sort of maldevelopment that occurs over the years when you haven't really got a consistently open heart that a lot of people, they might just, just be afraid, but some people, they might try to escape from their fear or escape subconsciously by turning it into anger. So instead of not, instead of just being afraid of things externally, they might go into this, instead of being afraid, they'll be like a flight kind of mentality. They're like, no, I'm going to defend myself. I'm going to stand up for myself. Suppose you get picked up on, like at school, some, someone might decide, you know what? No. I'm actually going to fight them. And you get angry and you get like that uh, more. I mean, it's just that people make a choice often, either fight or flight. And but personally, I, I started, it was in a way a maturation, but at the same time, it was worse as well as better. Because I wasn't dealing with my fear, fundamental fears. I was just turning it into something else. So I felt like, so if someone... I used to like, I wasn't very good at dealing with criticism or people being mean to me or whatever, right? So there was a situation where I was at the till and there's a woman who told me off for not saying thank you. I was going to say thank you, but I guess I, I was, I wasn't answering it yet or something. But in any case, I got very defensive. And I was just like, I think I called her a bitch or, or something. And I was like, oh yeah, I, I really stood up for myself. But really, I'd felt threatened and I tried to, and I turned it and I went on the attack instead of feeling weak. And that's like, you're, I would say it's like you start with a fear and then you can turn it into something else, but it's still, the same it's still fundamentally fear it just transmuted into something else negative and then there are other things that you can turn up these emotions into other negative emotions that you can turn it into like if you get frustrated i've heard someone say i can't remember what it was but that for example frustration can turn into hatred or you might just off afraid and then you get angry and then you get frustrated and then i don't know like these various possibilities and it's like this composite negative emotions that build up into this more and more, more tangled mess. I, I'm sorry for going on a bit, but I feel like once you start clearing these emotions down, like you you resolve your problem with getting angry at people, right? That was an issue I had. I used to get snap at people a lot when I felt when I was criticized or whatever, right? But once I, I've got a theory that when I broke that down and managed to overcome the issue with that anger and arguments. What I got is fear and par anxiety and paranoia instead. So I, I broke it down into more base fundamental closed heart emotion. But if you overcome the fear, then your heart opens easier, right? I mean, you need to love yourself and accept yourself, but yeah. So I feel like now fear is more the dominant negative emotion that I get. It's kind of a good sign in the sense that that's the last thing to clear out, maybe, other than not being present. Uh, does that make sense? Hmm. Yeah, I was... <laughs> I have to read this because... Wait, it's a great quote. It's from Yoda in Star Wars. He says... Fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. <laughs> but it, that's yeah. exactly right. It's definitely a good take on it. Yeah. 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 So I have to relate a story to you because you were talking about fight or flight, that these are these two responses that we um, can easily go to. <clears throat> earlier this year in the spring, I took my two daughters to a local park where there's a lot of... Oh, wait a sec. Uh, we might need to edit this out or maybe not. Uh, turns out I have a Trojan. 
apparently according to my antivirus outgoing type outbound huh yeah uh, i don't know if i'm going to take that out or not but yeah um Yeah, this is. Tell you what, carry on talking. <laughs> okay. Now I wanted to tell you the story because I I went to the park with my girls, and there's geese and ducks there, and I had my camera taking pictures of them, and um, at one point I was kneeling down taking pictures of some of the geese and ducks, and these three geese came out of the water and started walking toward me, and the way they were walking toward me, I knew what was going to happen, because the one in front was coming toward me in this aggressive way you know the wings were out head kind of down it was squawking and when it got closer I stood up and my oldest daughter was behind me she said dad and I said it's okay it's fine I got this covered and so that goose came up to me and sure enough it it attacked it started gnawing on my leg on my shin and I did the one thing that that goose was not expecting because everything in that goose's experience was fight or flight. Everyone it had attacked either fought back or probably ran away. But I just stood there. I didn't move. I just stood there and let it chew on my leg. It didn't really hurt. And after about 10 seconds, I just pushed it away with my other leg. And I just stood there, not moving, silent calm i wasn't angry and the goose stood there right in front of me for i don't know 30 seconds with its wings out squawking i just stood there and it slowly turned and just walked away but it in that it was that stillness that silence just standing in my place giving that goose something that it didn't know what to do with it didn't know what to do with me it had nothing in its experience to go by. And I, I see that valuable in a lot of ways in my life is when these experiences come and there's fear or anxiety instead of, uh, you know, reverting to these, these primitive responses, which is fight or flight, that standing still, even when there was an attack or a perceived attack, it dispelled the attack. The attacker went away because it doesn't know what to do with stillness. And that was a really remarkable lesson to me in that moment. Right. Well, it sounds a bit like what Eckhart Tolle recounted once, like a situation where some big muscular guy tried to intimidate him and he just was completely unresponsive. And this guy was weirded out and just walked off and I, like it, it it's that sometimes it's like it happens with other people as well if you just don't respond or you respond with love or something like yeah if you respond with compassion i i had to do that last loving, like, brave compassion especially helps when you're doing something negative yeah sorry carry on well, that's a good way to put it yeah, I, interestingly enough, last Saturday, I was at the same park with my daughters, <laughs> and I had my chalkboard with me, my podcast being by the chalkboard. I actually have a large yeah. chalkboard, and I write messages on it. Sometimes I sit outside. I'll do that today with a message on it for my neighbors in my neighborhood. And so I took my chalkboard with me to the park, and I had my camera and my microphone or my phone, and my, I had a handheld microphone inviting someone to sit down and just have a conversation with me. I had been sitting there an hour. My girls are playing in this play area. I'd been sitting there an hour by myself. I made one little video on my selfie stick on my phone. That was it. And suddenly I, I, re I realized someone was standing near me talking to me. And I turned around. It's a police officer. Someone had called the police on me, concerned about me, he said. Why? What have you done? Well, I, you know what? I was such in this present moment that I didn't even, I never asked him that. 
because when you're innocent, there's no reason to defend yourself. So I didn't defend myself at all. It didn't even come to mind. I just started up a conversation with him. He asked me a few questions. We talked about it and it was so remarkable. Turned out he was born in the same small town in Texas that my mom was born in very small town. And we instantly had this connection because I started dropping some names and then I was telling him what I was doing. Huh. It was so fascinating, but he went back to his police vehicle and I noticed that he was talking to a woman over there and I thought, well, maybe she called. Now, it's a little odd. I suppose somebody out here with a chalkboard and a few minutes later, she confronted me. She started yelling at me. You better not be taking pictures of my kids. And I just stepped back and I thought, what, what is this? You know, and what rose in my heart Action. is I realized that, you know, what? I think this woman has been hurt in her life because the only way you respond that way to someone mm. is if you have been hurt and there was no anger in me. Um, I didn't move. I talked to her, still invited her to sit down and just have a conversation instead of yell at me. And she wouldn't. I asked her to leave. I invited her to go get the police officer to come back if you would like to talk to both of us. And eventually someone else that she was with dragged her away. <laughs> but well, it was, yeah, it was just one of those experiences where the same thing, you know, with that goose, same park, that this primitive response of fight or flight, and those things rose within me, the thoughts of saying something or um, defending myself, you know, the thoughts rose within me, but it wasn't something I had to do. I didn't respond that way at all. I just stayed yeah. where I was. I didn't stand up. I just you stayed. You realize sitting. you have a choice. Sorry, pardon me. When you realize we have a choice, because if an, often we feel like it's being done to you and you feel this response rising up and we can just act unconsciously, just do it. Like there's programming in us to do that. Maybe we program ourselves or maybe by society. And it's like, we have free will. We don't have to respond based on that. So, I'll tell you what, let's talk about events, I guess. Yeah. How do you feel about lockdown and, like, well, the potential that it might be linked to a justification for, uh... no, there's a virus, and then there's talk about, like, use... the Great Reset seems to be happening at the same time that they're planning, and I'm just wondering seems a bit suspicious of anything that's going on yeah I, it's very suspicious there there seems to be a lot of this that's unnecessary and it seems to be more about control than about uh about helping about whether this virus actually exists or not you know i've listened to hundreds of doctors all over the world in the last you know six months talk about this write about this um giving their expert opinion listening to medical researchers that, you know, I've followed for 15 years, 20 years sometimes. And um, there, there's, a, there's a whole lot of information that's not based on science that the mainstream media is talking about. You know, it's fear. Every time I look at the lo even the local news here, um, the headlines just seem to be uh, written to keep people in fear. Um, a lot of the people wearing masks, it's just out of fear. It's out of watching the television and responding to that and just believing that, oh, this is the way I have to respond because there's this imminent threat to me. There's been so many movies written, uh, produced about this very thing, this very thing of how the government or organizations put out this fear that people believe it and it locks them down. And I just refuse to be locked down because of that. Yeah, I mean, just so how far <clears throat> the people don't seem to. What we, we don't actually, what is, sorry, it's just, we often don't question that we don't, what actually happens if you don't follow the rules? What actually happens? Like, if enough people don't follow it, they'll just have to drop it, right? Well, yes, and I, I think that's what needs to happen. You know, mm. I, I refuse to wear a mask most of the time here because I don't need one. I'm not sick. I have no symptoms. I'm not worried about being sick. I take good care of myself. I think those rules are completely unnecessary. 
Um, it's not protecting me from anything. You know, if you're walking through a supermarket with a mask and someone lets gas and you can smell it, well, that obviously is not protecting you from small particles of anything, is it? Um, I, I, I think it's, I think it's oppression. I think it's a violation of just basic liberty. I think the government doesn't have the authority in our country. The, the way our government works is the authority comes from the people. That's how it's supposed to work that here you have this authority. Well, you don't have the authority to lock things down and close restaurants. That's not, that's not, it's beyond the role of government to do that. And yet it's happening yeah. and it's crushing this, it's crushing our economy and our businesses. I mean, Texas is doing fairly well right now. We haven't locked down as much as some other places and some other countries that have really locked down. Um, here where I live, you know, you can still go eat at restaurants and go get some coffee and it's, it's pretty lax. I've been kicked out of two places for not wearing a mask. I say kicked out, refuse service. Um, a lot of it has been a misunderstanding because they don't, they don't even read the, the mandates. Our governor put out a mandate about, you know, the mask wearing and everything. Most people haven't even read it. They don't even know what it says. And so I would tell them that have you read the mandate? Cause you say you're enforcing it, but you're not enforcing it because there are exemptions in the mandate. You have to enforce that too. Right. Another thing it shows is that we, if people are willing to actually private on their own initiative, just without reading it, restrict us in that way, then we don't really need official lockdowns anyway. If people are scared, I mean, they would still, well, I mean, that's still a problem potentially if they would be restricted. But then there's the mass, the mass misinformation, you know? For example, with the recent election, I suppose I could be careful with this because I I want to be I'm more about having a unified perspective on things like politics, but a lot of people don't know about the information coming out about like the corruption, or at least when that's taught in the your election. And what is when it's talked about is framed in a very biased way. And this idea that some of the mainstream media are corrupt if they are like Fox and some of them aren't or whatever, whether with, with side you're on, right? The idea that some of the mainstream media are okay and some aren't like is a bit naive. Like it's both sides get a bit of kind of controlled, right? Yeah, I, I, uh, hmm. how do I talk about this? Um, I think it, it takes, it takes the individual, uh, where they're willing to, to just look, especially look without judgment. Okay. I'm going to take an honest look at this. I see what's being said. Let's go do some research. There's plenty of resources out there to research anything you want to. That's the important thing. Like we can't, it's not for us to tell you like, Fundamentally, here's an interesting thing about what this election, right? Because people say, oh, what about civil war? Isn't it worrying that, you know, if he, it, it, some people talk about if Trump gets, he doesn't get in, if his legal attempt, what he's doing legally doesn't work, that he was just going to refuse to leave, that there'll be a civil war, blah, blah, blah. Other people say, well, if he actually Biden doesn't get in after all, a lot of people won't accept it because they've been told that it's that he won and they just believe it or what the media say. And but then what happens then? They will think that the whole system's rigged. It doesn't matter whether or not it's true, they will think that it's all rigged. Then they will get more, then they'll start to question the main the mainstream narrative a bit more not to mention they'll question they'll probably look into the more maybe the more like to research and look up things up for themselves if they think the whole thing's rigged by trump staying in and maybe they'll be more like to find the truth even if the truth isn't what they expect it to be maybe so maybe it's a good thing not just for waking up people so on the right 
there being something wrong with the system, but waking everyone up, left or right or whatever. You know, I do feel like it's definitely a definite good side of this is that I don't want to generalize too much, but a lot of conservatives have typically been kind of complacent with the status of like there were a lot of the issues that people had about the war on terror for example was from the left at the time and they've often i mean the even the radical anti-capitalists at least at least they've been at least they've seen a problem with the overall system there's a lot of uh people on the right haven't necessarily so much especially conservatives and I feel like it's this year has been the ultimate red pill. And people who wouldn't have questioned it before are. And it looks terrible. It looks really worrying about the potentially Orwellian measures they'll be bringing with this. Well, they want to bring in with the Great Reset and all of that. But perhaps it's going to utterly backfire because everything they try to do seems to be being revealed. Because people aren't buying stuff anymore. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm. You know, I'm thankful living in in a time where we have access to a lot of information to look at those things ourselves. There's a lot of conflict. There's a lot of disagreeing information going back and forth. There's a lot of narrative being put out. You know, the news should be reporting news, not telling you what to believe, not telling you what to think. But with all this conflict, the conflict has to cause people some people to look deeper to take honest look because doesn't it work that way individually it works that way just with you when did you start really looking in your life it's when you're undergoing deep conflict right when you got conflict within you that's when you really start looking that's when people wake up that's what happened to Eckhart Tolle that's what happened to a lot of people who came who were enlightened and continue to to grow in that it's because of that conflict. There's questions. Something isn't right, and you got to start looking. This always happens. It always happens. So if it happens within you, it's going to happen in this world in the same way. It's like the world is an expression of you as an individual. These things that you experience in your own life individually with conflict and these struggles, this happens in the world in the same way. It's always going to lead to a, a greater awareness and enlightenment about things. It does, as with it, sorry. It may not. As with it. it may not seem. That's okay. It may not seem that way at the time, but it's going to do that. A lot of people, through just the election here in the U.S., have become aware of a deeper corruption that's been going on behind the scenes for a very long time. There's been immense vote fraud going on for. The, I know for sure for the last twenty years because I've been researching it and looking. All right. If you don't think vote fraud's been going on on both sides, it has as if there's a side. It's been going on. You can go and look and research and see the evidence. There's immense amounts of it that have gone on in different probably, ways all across this country. Probably both parties. I mean, also across the world. Right now. Now I'm going to put my tune for hat on here because <laughs> I, I I believe there's a. I mean, people have talked about it and all of it lived. <laughs> but <laughs> if you talk about Kennedy, for example, like, but um, yeah, um, there's this, I believe that there's, you could call it the Illuminati, the Cabal or whatever, right? That there's, that there's groups of people who control the narrative. And that I believe that the ongoing awakening uh they're panicking and that's why they're going so far and actually doing so much that's kind of a risk that they wouldn't normally do because if people are wet and waken and open their hearts they can't be controlled so easily right they know this so and they control elections for a long time we, we don't know about that i mean they've controlled they've been funding both sides of wars and all of that Ever since, no, even prior to Napoleon, probably just for a long time, we've all been manipulated and controlled in some respect by fear. I mean, like, you can go back to the Catholic Church influencing us, and you can look at the Knights Templar and their 
potentially having you know it's, it's kind of a secret society essentially uh you know for a long time there's been this influence and an example of voter fraud has been you know this i can't remember what it's called but the system that was run was being to use the company that was and their election electoral system on like the computerized electoral system it's the same one that hugo chavez used to win elections they're the same organization right and it was set up deliberately for that purpose and people don't realize that it's it's not reported on right you have to go to alternative news to find that but the yeah, informa- but I- there's plenty of information about it. That's the thing. It's just you're never going to find it on the mainstream media because they don't want people to see that. Right. But this isn't a right or left thing. This is, you know, they, they, they'll, they'll make sure one party wins in one country and another party wins in the another country. There might be a different ideology because I think that the controlling elite, they, they don't want, it's not about left or right for them. It's about, they win or they get their agenda continued regardless of who it is right when you fund bo- when you fund both sides of a war <laughs> your 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 agenda is different than the narrative that gets put out like all right this side needs to win the war or that side needs to win the war well if you can step back and profit from the whole thing that's your objective you don't care who dies i'll right? just come to a realization that if unity, unity is an important spiritual concept to me because, you know, I believe in the law of one, everything's one or unified. So unity to me is kind of like a synonym for God, but also it's a way for us to come together if we unify and uh, social unity and being in balance, right? But then there's another kind of, it's not unity, it's the opposite of division now, you could say unity looks kind of, I wouldn't call it centrist because that's an overly left versus right way of looking at it where it's just halfway between. But if, if you transcend the whole thing, we can have unity by having sort of aspects of different political perspectives all unified. But what they do is they're also transcending the whole political compass with divide and conquer. They're not involved in left and right. They use both or all lots of ideologies they'll they'll have people infiltrate them and basically try to control the narrative of each all of them and get them to fight each other so in a way it's like they're the opposite but in a they're kind of the same in this one sense that they're transcending politics and if we transcend the political divides we counter or that goes against the whole it kind of neuters the whole plan that they've got, right? It trumps it, ironically. Um, maybe that's what, hmm, I'm not sure how Trump fits into this though, because you could say he divides people. But I don't know. People disagree about whether he's part of the conspiracy or whether he's, or the conspiracies, or whether he's the solution. Whether he's a light worker, that's what some Laurie Ladder said that a, a YouTuber, and some said he, he's then this QAnon would say that oh he's the savior of some, some way sense right, but then there's other people, who, not all on the left, who feel that maybe he's. I mean, one perspective could be that maybe he's just so convenient for your perspective from the right that maybe it's just he's a setup. I don't believe that but I believe it's possible. Um, and then there's the whole thing, well, he's the worst guy ever and a Nazi or whatever, but you can understand why people feel that way, even if you don't agree. Hmm. Do you have any questions? Because I've been asking all the questions. <laughs> It's interesting to get your perspective on our election, you know, to hear what you have to say from over there in England, looking at, you know, what's going on in the United States and, and, and uh, what you guys are, are hearing over there. 
I, I, I guess it's similar to what's over here as far as the mainstream media goes. I wouldn't say that I, my views are that of the typical Brit, to be honest. I mean, we, we actually, a lot of the politics we hear about is American anyway. It's not just, um, well, I don't really look at mainstream media, so I follow alternative media. But alternative media is kind of globalized, right? So, yeah, we, we people all around the world are hearing about American politics. It makes a big difference, right? You're a powerful country. Yeah. Or live in one. Yeah, live in one. Yeah, I, I, you know, I've described politics as uh, it's it's one aspect of life. It's it's a piece of life that we have to be involved in. Some people more than others, but there are so many aspects of life. I was talking to one of my neighbors one day, and she she was really happy, and I said, "So why why are you happy?" And she said, "Cause cause Biden won the election." I said, "So if he didn't win the election, would you not be happy?" <laughs> you know, and I was saying, but because happiness has nothing to do with an election, right? Not really. Happiness has to do with what's in here. We need to look at it, be involved, but happiness has nothing to do with who is elected president. If you're emotionally involved in the outcome of the election or emotionally involved in the outcome of anything else, you have an expectation and then that expectation doesn't happen. Are you now sad? Is your life miserable because of that? This requires a different looking at what your life is because my life aspect has nothing to do with who's elected president. Now I have my thoughts about it. I pay attention to it to a point, but that doesn't affect my, my happiness. It doesn't affect my, my gratitude in any way. I can, I, I can bless the winner, <laughs> the winner, um, no matter yeah. what happens. And I, I, to me, that's the most, the more important perspective is to be involved, to look at these things, but to realize happiness doesn't come from any aspect of politics. It comes from within you. This is where you have to look to find it. But at the same time, we have to be involved in it because it's happening where you live, wherever you live, there's political stuff going on. Wherever you live, there's probably people who are very generous and, and want to be in politics because they want to do the best for you and for the people. And there's no doubt people who want to be in politics because they want power and they want to control things. Yeah. I feel like something sad has happened to politics because everyone will think politics is inherently a corrupt thing. Oh, I don't like politics. You get people say, I don't like politics because, you know, they're all corrupt or you know there's plenty of problems with it at least how it's become and maybe it's just maybe it's just a manifestation of the age we're in and i mean age of the epic i mean like to get really into like mystical stuff now i believe in something called the law of one or you know and that sort of thing it's i guess it's a new age movement or something otherwise known as the great awakening that's another way people talk about it and there's this idea that our level of reality it's called third density or maybe 3d or what have you this level of reality is about polarity or duality and so we're going to get these divisions we're going to get people more in fear but there's always the potential to move beyond that but for a lot of people, the main frequency is at a certain level. And now we're coming out of that into the next age, the age of Aquarius. And there's this opportunity, potentially. It's almost like a co cosmic clock, right? And we're, we're at an opportunity where it's a lot easier to awaken. But it's a window of opportunity. Like, it doesn't necessarily happen. But a lot of people are awakening a lot easier. And we have the opportunity for politics to become what it really has the potential to be. Something that isn't toxic. 
and full of hate and division, but a more enlightened politics. And what is that politics? Well, it, it has to do with how we how we operate our society, what is what the policy is, what is and there's no reason if that is if everyone had open hearts on the whole world, imagine what politics would be like. Right. What that tells us is that politics isn't inherently corrupt or bad. It's it's all about the participants and what their frequency is. And it reflects that. And we're all participants in a sense. I mean, we're participants even if we're even by letting it get that way, get it get to how it's been. Or even like back in feudal times, that they were participants by not rising up against the feudal oppressors. Yeah, so yeah, you, you mentioned the the law of one, also called the raw material, R A which I found fascinating when I read it. Um, what, what about the raw material um, did, you, did you enjoy or that seemed to have a, a positive effect to you? Well, when it clicked, when I was exposed to enough of it, when I'm talking about it and discussing it with a friend and, it clicked and I was like, wait a minute. So there's more to reality than to simply like particles and stuff. Like there's actually a spiritual aspect of reality that's real. And that was just like, that changed everything. I was like, wow, wow. Okay. 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 So this is actually how it is, or at least this is, this is, uh, this is actually, there's this whole spiritual aspect of reality about energy and vibration. And it's not this stark reality I, I came to believe in where we die and it's over and there's no objective meaning or purpose to reality anyway. And it's just like, because that's what I believed. I, I mean, I, I, I toyed with existentialism and stuff because I didn't like the nihilism that was fundamentally implied from their scientific worldview and the materialistic, physicalist worldview that we're taught in the society, essentially. And I didn't like it. I just felt that, well, it's just the logical, hard facts that we need to believe in. And I was scared of death. Loads of us are scared of death. And it, I mean, one thing that was comforting to realize that there's more to it and that there's actually a sort of spiritual element to it after all. But it was a spiritual explanation of things that wasn't it wasn't the turn off that like classical monotheism is like you got all these rules you have to follow just because obey god and why is god like that well, just obey and if it seems like an absolute tyrant you're morally at fault but feeling that way <laughs> sort of thing and well, I mean, later I got I, I I found out why, and it has to do with it's the morality put forth or encouraged by negative entities, or those aligned with essentially what to use Star Wars as a metaphor, the dark side, or there's even reference to the archons and negative aliens. It, it, I, honestly, I got really into that. At one point, and I went down the rabbit hole and see alien conspiracies and stuff like that. <laughs> and it, it is honestly, it's a stage everyone, a lot of people get into when they get into these conspiracy theories. And the one, I, I guess, like the, you get into this idea of like, okay, you see the dark side of reality a bit more, and it's scary. And then you need to kind of take a step back out of that, I guess. I'm digressing, but. The narrative as well, it's, it's you get more hope about things because, well, there's less of that disheartening nihilism, I suppose, nihilism. And then it's a beautiful description of reality. And the alternative history that you get from it actually really starts kind of makes sense. And it does actually fit in with 
a bit with what we've been taught. It just requires a few adjustments. Like it was interesting how it described the Pharaoh Akhenaten, who he decided that there was all only there's actually only one God. And later on, that was changed by the priests. Who, after he died, the priests decided, no, that's heresy. That that's all wrong. They defaced him and everything. But according to the raw material, Akhenaten was visited by Ra himself. From and at Ra's and Venus, and I was like, okay. Now I understand that the people who haven't come across any of this and it's, they just hear about this stuff from the outset, that's like, what? That's crazy. That's crazy. But as I discovered the more fundamental aspects of that form of mysticism, this new age form of mysticism, and everything's energy and vibration and different vibration energetic vibrations that emotions are energy and there's different energy vibrations of the emotions different emotions and awakening and stuff to do with like yeah th that sort of thing like it all started to click into place and it's just yes yeah, it's, it's, be it's beautiful portrayal of reality and it's a lot brighter because I had a grim perspective of reality, really. Yeah. So what was it like for you discovering it? What's your story about how you discovered it and what it was like for you? I, I can't even remember how I discovered it. Um, it was probably a quote or somebody had mentioned it in something else I was reading. And then I went down that, you know, that trail to... to Okay, I want to read all of that if they're quoting from it. I want to know what what the source is from this. I I thought I thought it was profound. It was it was uh, um, a lot of it really resonated with me. One of the things that I really enjoyed in there was the uh, the the poker game. Do you remember them talking about the poker game? I love that. I'll be old. honest with you, uh, I haven't actually read it all. I. What I did is I discovered a reading of it on or on um, YouTube and I I listened to certain beginning chapters of it, you know, and I found it captivating. But then what I started just researching like people talking about it on Reddit or like um, online people describing the stuff, the lore of it, I suppose. Um, L O R E, I guess, and you know the the that that stuff about it, and then then what really educated me about it was living the law of one, one hundred one, the choice by Carlo Ricard. So it's basically like a primer or a summary of all the ideas, and it, it really breaks it down in a really helpful way. So that was interesting. I have this idea. Right, I want to get get the book and I'll open a random page intuitively and see what comes up. And give me a second, I'll just get into my bookshelf. Yeah, anyway, this is something I've started doing. Well, I got these spiritual books now, I've got a bunch of them, and I either ask my intuition or ask my higher self. Or sometimes like ask my spirit guides or something. And I'm like, so I just, so I just like ask, just randomly pick a book when I have closed eyes. And then I pick a random page and then I just read it. And I feel like it's a really interesting thing to do because you do, you, sometimes it really does feel like, like, there's a reason why it's that page and that it does feel like it's relevant. Now, obviously confirmation bias, I, I know someone who would be skeptical about it would say it's confirmation bias, but well, I, I understand that, but I have faith, so it doesn't really bother me anyway. So 
Okay. What is this? I don't know. I'll do it again. That this bit, this, this picture in the description, it seems a bit. All right. Huh. Okay, so here's something interesting. Here's a sequence of, pardon me. Yeah, I'll go with this. Just... So here's an example of how it reads a lot of it. So it says, R, Ra, colon. And then it just says what you said. So Ra, I am Ra. I am desirous of being in non-violation of the free will distortion. To name those involved in the future of your space time is to infringe, thus we withhold this information. We request your contemplation of the fruits of the actions of those entities whom we may observe enjoying this the distortion towards power. In this way, you may discern for yourself this information. We shall not interfere with the, shall we say, planetary game. It is not central to the harvest. And harvest is an interesting word that some people don't like when it comes to this because it sounds like potentially scary, <laughs> like a cosmic horror sort of thing, but I don't think that's what it is. It's, anyway, so... No, I was going to talk about that for a second, that this is in a lot of religions too and they talk about it in different words and different languages but the way that law of one talks about it is that this you know this this existence that we're in here what you called what they call third density it vibrates on a certain frequency right and that this frequency is going to change that this earth is going to change frequencies and start vibrating on a higher frequency that and people who are um within this frequency range are going to transition into the next frequency. So all different religions for a long time have written about these things in different languages. The Bible talks about it. It just uses different words, but it talks about a new heaven and a new earth. Something new is happening. Um, the law of one talks about it as a vibration range where the earth is going to undergo this change. And those who are of the right vibration range will be going with it. It's really interesting to read and in the way that they describe it. Okay, so this is interesting information here that I found another page or the next page. I'm, I'm not sure how much you guys are comfortable with me reading out, but. So. Where do I start? Well, there's stuff about the Orion group. That wasn't... Okay, it's talking about Tesla. They start talking about Tesla at one point. That's where they get to. How was the question... was questioner. How was Tesla's work supposed to benefit man on Earth, and what were its purposes? Ra. I am Ra. The most desired purpose of the mind-body-spirit complex, Nikola, was the freeing of all planetary entities from darkness, from the darkness. Thus, it attempted to give to the planet the infinite energy of the planetary sphere for use in lightning and power questioner by freeing the planetary entities from darkness precisely what do you mean i ra i am ra most of the following answer was lost due to the tape recorder malfunction the core of the response was as follows we spoke of freeing people from darkness in a literal sense questioner what would would this freeing from darkness be commensurate with the law of one or does it have a any real product. Ra, I am Ra. The product of such freeing would create two experiences. Firstly, the experience of no need to find the necessary in moment for payment in your money or energy. Second, secondly, the leisure afforded thereby exemplifying the possibility and enhancing the probability of the freedom to then search the self, the beginning of seeking the law of one. Few there are working physically from daybreak to darkness, as you name them, upon your playing, who can contemplate the law of one in a conscious fashion. 
What about the Industrial Revolution in general? Was it planned in any way? Ra and Ra. This will be the final question in the session. That is correct. Wanderers incarnated in several waves, as you might call them, in order to bring into existence the gradual freeing from the demands of diurnal cycles and the lack of freedom of leisure. Well, there's a whole bunch of other interesting stuff, but... Oh! Oh, there is actually another question. Because this will be interesting, because it talks about polarity a bit. Ra, I am Ra, you are doing well. The most important thing is to carefully align the symbols. They just made the particular time space present when Adiant, when Adiant the this instrument, physical complex in the distortion towards comfort. May we ask if you have any other short questions we resolve in this closing session? Questioner, I do, I do not know if this is a short question or not, so we can save it till next time. But my question is, why do the Crusaders from Orion do this? What is their ultimate objective? This is probably not too long to answer. Ra, I am Ra, this is not too long to answer. To serve the self is to serve all. The service of the self, when seen in this perspective, requires an ever-expanding use of energies of others for manipulation to the benefit of the self for distorted distortion towards power. If there are any other queries to further explain the subject, we shall be with you again. So that's interesting because it talks about that is what the elites are doing and they've been doing for a long time they are incarnated on earth with an interpretation or a path towards one that's very self-centered and seeking power and that's not the path that most of us are on and most people read the law of one aren't interested in that in that path but when it says the crusaders i wonder if the actual is it saying that the Crusades were actually largely done. The actual warriors who went out there were actually incarnated from elsewhere. I'm not sure, but it, this is an example of the sort of stuff it goes into. It's really interesting. The language is used is done in a certain way by Ra. I hope it was interesting anyway, because I kind of went on at length. So, uh, yeah. I, I mentioned the poker game. I want to paraphrase it. I can't remember right, exactly what it be. said, but... Uh, one of the the things that is brought up, the subjects, is reincarnation. Ra talks about that um, several times. And so the questioner asks, okay, if reincarnation is a real thing and we enter into another life, how come we forget? How come we can't remember ah. past lives? Wouldn't it be more beneficial? Wouldn't we grow faster and learn faster if we could remember our past lives? And Ross said, let's examine this as a poker game. And imagine in a poker game, you knew all the cards. You knew your cards. You knew the cards all the other players were holding. The game would be uninteresting. You would win, but there's no interest in it. Let's re-examine this into another poker game that lasts a lifetime. And the cards you are holding are love, hate, pleasure, joy, dislike, etc 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 and ross said you may not remember the rules of this game you may not remember the cards you're holding you may not remember the cards you've played but the way to win the game is to take all your cards and lay them face up on the table and within yourself say to all the other players other players no matter what cards you hold no matter what cards you play i love you this is how to win the game. And I thought, man, that is just rich. Right. If they remembered, that might get in the way of winning. But I don't really understand how that fits into the metaphor. Um, there is a beautiful metaphor, though. It is. And certainly, love is the answer, at least... Yeah, I mean, certainly, if you're going to do the service to others path, which most would want to do, to be honest, um, which is about, well, helping others and finding, you know, seeing the divinity in your loving relationships, love of others, uh, then, then the way to win is 
it's not actually winning by the regular means, not by winning the game in the three D, you know, in the typical sense. Like it's not like a, the way it's described by Carla Rookard actually is that there's a chess game. And um, regular, and regular on Earth for a long time, what it's been the way it looks like in three in a regular three D experience that we win by this by gaining more power or, and taking out their pieces and basically better benefiting in terms of yourself and your ego and what in the, in the very in material terms and position in society and getting up more status and all of that. But if you win, to win on a soul level, you want to awaken, right? You want to and learn and grow. And to do that, it's not so much about, it's not so much about winning in base value, but following your conscience, so to speak, doing, growing spiritually into more loving opening your heart essentially if you fully open your heart loving others unconditionally you've won in that sense right because that's the capability that's what that's basically the requirement for ascending to the next the fourth density up and third that's all it really is required and there's a chakra aspect of this which is to do with opening of for your um, heart chakra, essentially. And to do that, apparently, you need to need to fully accept yourself. No, fully know yourself. Fully, don't you need to know yourself, accept yourself, and forgive yourself, essentially. That's mm. what it's about. Because you can't love others if you don't love yourself. Yeah, because it's, it's, uh, it's, love is a sharing you know you share and you can only share from your abundance from your overflow and if you don't love yourself there's no there's no overflow there you know that's what the potential danger of self-help is that you might start you might become in a place where you're you're guilty about some things or you're you very you might become dis, very dissatisfied with how you are and constantly trying to change but without really being kind to yourself and that could actually get in the way hmm. whereas really doing the inner it's about the inner work not about outer changes you make dealing with the negativity within you the negative emotion, dealing with the healthy ways, dealing with the subconscious stuff you've got built up. And it can be messy, but once you get through it, yeah, it's a lot better. Yeah, I would say so. Hmm. Anything else in the law of one or about the law of one that particularly intrigues you or sticks out to you? I like what I like the description of uh, the creation of the pyramids. To our listener, I would that, that's a to me that made more sense than anything else I'd ever read about the how the pyramids were made. But it was something. If somebody's interested, they'll have to go read it because it's it's uh it's longer than I can describe here. But it was very fascinating. That makes more sense than anything I've read. The way I describe it, really put simply, is that. Was it using the power of the mind to create it from a thought form almost? Something like that. I, I don't remember all the description now. I just remember I really enjoyed reading it and that it, it, it made a lot more sense than just about anything that I had read previously about how the pyramids were made. And it was profound. I mean, it's deeply profound. Hmm. But that's just my experience of it. So who knows? <laughs> But within all of that, um, one of the most important things that I have to remember is that um, 
I like to keep my attention on things that are from my own experience, from my witness. Just reading something, I have no witness to, you know, a whole lot of things that, that are in the raw material. There's a lot of interesting information in there, history. Um, but what have I witnessed to? What have I actually seen in my own life? Because that's really what I know. And yeah. so when I come from my own experience of things, there's a, there's a valid testimony of that. If I'm just repeating stuff, sometimes I call it fact vomiting. Yeah, I've been pretty good at that in my life. <laughs> just fact vomiting, <laughs> just spilling stuff that I've read. But I, I like to try to stay focused more on my own experience of things. And um, because those things come from my heart. Yeah, and I'm not sure if I was from my heart when I was just quoting from the book, to be honest. It's, it's interesting oh. to look at. It's very interesting to look at and interesting to read and interesting to discuss. Um, but the truth of the matter, and the raw material even talks about this, is you, you got to find that, that your own value from your heart of you. Right. And when you find your value, you'll see it in others. It's a natural I, thing. I feel like with a lot of spirituality, you can either look at the core principles or you can look at all the theory and the factoids that they present as fact or truth you know that there, there's you could almost fluff is almost overly dismissive of it but yeah i suppose a lot of it to, to what really matters especially in mysticism is the the core principles and from that actually i was interviewing someone just the other day and what what we came to is that what really matters is if you look at mysticism all these different forms of mysticism they have a lot of common ground whether you're looking at the sufis or the kabbalah or well the law of one even uh there's a lot of it, it, there's a lot of similarity in christian mystics as well even like like for example meister eckhart who has a, seems to have a soul connection to eckhart tolle maybe i, I don't know <laughs> but I don't know about that, but yeah, there's all these different, in any religion, there's a mystical side of it where they'll have a lot of similarities to each other, these different mysticisms. And we can talk about Asian aliens and we can talk about the Orion Wars or all sorts of things that have happened or even how the pyramids were built. And fundamentally what really matters, what really matters is the life teachings about how to live a good life, open your heart, deal with your emotions and in a healthy way, and like how to be aware of the spiritual choice that we have and the ability to create reality that we have with the law mm -hmm. of attraction and stuff like that. That's what really matters. And I don't think you know, Ra seemed willing to give information, but I don't think he would want. I don't think Ra would want us. I, I'm not sure if Ra is even he necessarily. I, I don't think they would want us to actually only go with all this law, but not actually apply the teachings and for life at, and the core principles. Mm, right. And that, that seemed to be the intent was, you know, as, as they said, we're here to serve. Honestly, people, there's questioners and there's the channeler and the channel being will, will answer the questions, right? So it's kind of up to the questioner. Yeah. So people might be wondering how it works, how channeling works, what channeling is, how did was the raw material developed? And they'll have to read that because it's, there's a, the first part of it is like 70 pages of just their introduction of who they are and what they were doing. It's, it's very well described. The, there's a website that goes into it. I think it's L, 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 L slash L research. If you type that in Google, you'll probably find a website. Actually, I'll type it in now so it comes up, but yeah. Um, they describe it in the book itself it describes the process of how they did it because they actually tried to do it scientifically it's just 
if you don't but if you're skeptical about non-mainstream science you you might you just it might not take it seriously that one thing that concerns me is that there just seems to be a bias in science these days it's firstly it's a materialist bias and secondly there's the corporate aspect of it where a lot of funding or the governments or the corporations are funding it in a way where they're actually influencing the studies and the the actual results such that it's not truly scientific anymore in many cases and especially with climate science and i i do believe that there is um that we can affect we can cause climate change or affect the climate but i there's a very political narrative that's been pushed when it comes to the climate for example this is just a case study right an example and it's all about us there's a particular narrative anyway like green taxes and stuff like that and it's interesting that looking at the planet makes sense but it's interesting with the great reset that they're just they're trying to justify it using green polit polit green politics and justification although they'll use anything as a justification if it can get people on side like they'll talk about social justice and stuff or they'll talk about anything that appeals to people and they'll talk about protecting you from disease and that anyone might if anyone's scared of that well they might be receptive and mm. it's based on fear right largely that's funny wikipedia calls the law of one ufo religion <laughs> Yeah, well, they explored UFOs too. I think that's probably one of the reasons that's. Uh, yeah, I was interviewing someone the other day. I was like, but why UFOs? <laughs> and it's like, so this, this is someone who's into mysticism, but not new age mysticism. And that's actually a reasonable question. But when you get into it, you actually start. The idea of UFOs being involved is kind of. Starts to feel natural or normal somehow. <laughs> that's funny. Hmm. All right. Well, what else you got, Nick? Anything else? Well, I don't want to dominate it too much. So, how about you choose what we talk about next? Well, I've got a. I'm gonna have to go here in a little bit because I've got something to do um, for the afternoon. It's Thanksgiving here on uh, in the United States, so I do have some plans. I mean, Thanksgiving is quite a nice. You can look at the origins of it. And you can look at how the natives are treated. And obviously that's sad. It's very, it's terrible, right? But at the same time, being thankful, being grateful, that's good, right? That that has a very, that raises your frequency, even in the morning if you're grateful. Yeah. Yeah, it's necessary. Yeah. I'm going to spend the rest of my day being thankful purposely. <laughs> yeah, because it's easy to not be thankful when things are great, right? But it's a good times or a good time to be thankful. Well, any time is a good time to be thankful, really. Yeah, you can always find something to be thankful for. Yeah, Nick, I probably need to get off here and, and uh, get ready because... Got to get my uh, get a couple things together for the afternoon. All right. Is there any way? Would you like to finish off with some sort of anecdote or something? Well, I would tell my listener, our listener today, that your life is of great value. Whatever you perceive about yourself, there's always something more to learn. There's always something greater to see. That what you think you are today, if you're having a difficult time. Your value is much greater than that. Keep looking, keep searching. Don't give up. Um, keep asking questions. One of the most important things is to ask questions and to seek that out. The answers will come to you. But the important thing is to get up and do something. You must do something. Don't sit. Don't be lethargic. 
there there's an activity we're here for activity it doesn't mean you have to be physically moving but you have to be active in this life to be this life so stay active do things and pursue the things that come from your heart listen spend time being still learn meditation pray search things out and read and value good friends value good conversation and uh, and watch your life expand thank you that was beautiful all right well goodbye listener and goodbye gary goodbye nick thank you so much for this conversation today yeah it was a pleasure bye <laughs> bye bye